Okay, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, November edition of the EU Circular Talks. Um, my name is uh, Agnes Schurmans. I'm working for SGS Intron in the Netherlands and I'm your moderator uh, this afternoon. Uh, we are very happy that you are all there. Uh, we are discussing the infrastructure sector uh, this afternoon and especially how we can close material cycles in a sustainable way and in such a way that we contribute to the circular economy. And the focus this afternoon is how we should cooperate in Europe together uh, to get us there. Uh, once again, on behalf of the organizers, uh, who are the Dutch Road Authorities, Rijkswaterstaat and the German Sustainability Council, DGMB, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you will see our program for this afternoon. Uh, I'm not going uh, uh, to repeat it, uh, but before we start, uh, I want to share the usual household rules, household rules with you. Um, you are all put on mute. Uh, any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, we have some Q&A in between in the webinar. Uh, and at the end, uh, we also have a special chat session. Uh, the details you will, will receive at the end of the webinar, uh, where we can further discuss uh, more questions. Um, and it's already announced in your invite. Uh, this webinar is recorded and um, presentations will become available on the website, event website afterwards. So uh, let's start. Uh, the more time, the more um, we have for the Q&A. Uh, and first, uh, the reason why we organize this webinar is explained uh, by Christine Lemaitre, CEO of the German Sustainability Council, DGMB. She will introduce us uh, to the why of this webinar and the relevance, of course, for of the infrastructure to contribute. Ms. Lemaitre, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Agnes, and uh, welcome from my side. I'm actually very excited that today we can address together that very relevant topic of the infrastructure. And um, I think we all are very aware of like the big numbers where the CO2 emissions, the resource consumption in the construction industry comes from, but it's mainly always focused on, on high rise buildings. And but if we look at around 60 percent, at least in Germany, of the CO2 emissions in construction is coming from infrastructure, meaning building bridges, streets, tunnels. Um, this topic has been very much overlooked all that time. So if we look at the big the big uh, drivers we see to reduce CO2 emissions, to reduce resources, we have to address the infrastructure, the infrastructure that's all around us, the infrastructure we need in order to maintain the life in our cities, our urban development, everything is heavily based and relying on infrastructure. And I think especially on the European level, we have to talk about collaboration on how we can bring the value chain together in order to decrease the amount of transport emissions to, to make it the, to close the cycles locally or regionally and to make really sure that material is, is used in the right way, that we're not generating waste where we don't need to generate waste and that we provide high quality infrastructure because we are in the middle of a lot of challenges all around the world and the the rebuild of the infrastructure will be a very crucial part the making the infrastructure future proofed and therefore this circular talk is now focusing on the infrastructure on the value chain we will hear different perspectives and hopefully we will find synergies and ways on how to collaborate so that is from my side. Thank you very much. And I really hope this is the kickoff for all of us to get more active, to put more emphasis on infrastructure, get politicians, get the commission aware of the big relevance and start moving and generate a sustainable infrastructure with a circular, which is CO2 reduced, which preserves the biodiversity all around us. So thank you very much. And I give the floor back to Agnes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, that's a very clear message indeed. Uh, more focus for the infrastructure uh, would definitely help to, to achieve uh, the European goals. And therefore, we are very happy uh, that the EU Circular to Talks host uh, this webinar this afternoon. Uh, and we have uh, from the organization, uh, Mr. Plastianu, I hope I pronounced it correctly, 
Uh, he's president of the Romanian Construction Entrepreneurs Association and vice president of the General Union of Romanian Industrialists. Uh, he will explain us uh, more about EU circular talks uh, as a good means, good tool for exchanging information for this European cooperation. Uh, Mr. Plasciano, please explain us a bit more. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I should like to thanks to the organizers for bringing forward this topical subject today. And I need to emphasize also that I represent today in this uh, debate also the European Economic and Social Committee. As many of you already know, the platform is an European one-stop shop for the circular economy community. It is a place for dialogue and the bridge between existing circular economy initiatives. In fact, the content on the website comes from you, the stakeholders, with a debate continuously being nourished online through our communication channels such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and our newsletter. The concept was launched in 2020 as the ideal forum for stakeholders to come together and exchange their ideas and practices in specific fields, such as the construction and infrastructure subject. Yeah, this idea of a space for stakeholders to exchange is exactly what the Commission and our committee had in mind when they launched ECESP five years ago. The platform aims to foster the circular economy at the European level, but driven by stakeholders on the ground. Allow me to take a few minutes to talk about the European Economic and Social Committee. The EU body is other parent institution of the platform and acts as a driver for sustainability while identifying the barriers throughout its opinions. It is its role as consultative body to the EU institutions, the committee organizes thematic exchanges with a wide range of civil society actors and prepares opinion on issues related to secondary raw materials and circular economy, drawing on input from the experts in the employers, workers and civil society organizations groups. The construction sector is one of the most resource demanding industrial sectors in the EU. It is also the sector where adopting circular economy practices represents Europe's best chance to reduce the environmental impact of the production and consumption of raw materials. This shift could also help boost the EU market for secondary raw materials, which is high on the agenda of the EESC through the work of the opinions and the ECESP also. Collaboration among all the actors throughout the value chain is essential to addressing these challenges. The benefits of cooperation can provide solutions in closing infrastructure material cycles. How to do it, what are the obstacles and opportunities is exactly what we are all here to discuss today. The committee stresses the importance of creating a market for secondary raw materials in Europe. The availability and quality of secondary raw materials and their improved collection represents a win-win situation as it helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the dependency on raw material imports, thus adding resilience and especially still a permanent material that is circular by design. Standardization plays also a crucial role in the European construction sector. It would help to promote the circularity of construction products, addressing the barriers in the single markets for construction products and contribution to the European Green Deal and the CEIP. The committee believes that standardization should be an industry-driven bottom-up process in which all stakeholders work together cooperatively and flexibly to have up-to-date standards that are crucial to enable sustainability and digitization and support innovation in the construction sector in a fast and timely manner, also held by social dialogue with the social partners in the process. For the stakeholder platform to continue being relevant and valuable to a broader audience, we need you to provide more practices. We invite you to submit your good practice, knowledge, strategy, and that might be where the first step for collaboration can start. Your content enriches the existing range of good practices in secondary raw materials in the construction and infrastructure. With stakeholders driven content on its website and an ever growing community on social media, regular uploading of these good practices is essential to keep the conversation active, 
and to avoid repeating lessons which have already been learned for several consumers. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to the moderator and I'm thanking you, looking forward to a fruitful exchange. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Plescianu. Uh, that's uh, very interesting to hear. We are very happy uh, to use uh, your platform uh, for this European debate. And I'm pretty sure that all our speakers and audience uh, are looking uh, forward to taking up the challenge uh, in cooperation in this uh, context. Thanks a lot. Um, before we go to this European debate and of course the European policies, we first want to know the opinion of you, of the audience, and we prepared a small poll for this purpose. I hope it can be shown now on the screen. And um, it's about the relevance of the infrastructure uh, that's already emphasized by Ms. Lemaitre and by Mr. Plustianu. Um, okay. Um, the, yep, I can see the poll now in my screen. I hope you can see it too. And the question is about the relevance of the infrastructure. And is this relevance reflected in the existing European circular policies sufficiently? Uh, the answer is yes, no, don't know. Uh, please submit so that we have a nice bridge to the net, net, uh, next speaker. I think uh, in a couple of seconds uh, we will uh, probably see the outcome of the poll. And we all had the opportunity. Uh, to give our opinion. It's still running in my screen. Yeah, is, is the result already there? I'm looking to the organizers of the platform. Yes, Agnes, the results are there. Oh, I can't see them. So we have uh, 50 responses and uh, out of the 50 responses, 50% um, answered no, 44% answered I don't know, and only 6% answered yes. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> it's a, uh, a little bit what we expected, uh, but um, it is confirmed and uh, therefore uh, a challenge for our next speaker. Welcome, uh, Mr. Mosley from uh, DG Grow from the European uh, Commission. Um, Mr. Philip Mosley uh, is working on the circular economy as well as energy and climate policies for construction uh, within the Commission. Uh, and of course, we are very eager to hear from you, Philip, uh, what the policies are in this area and of course, how if and how infrastructure is included, since most of the participants uh, believe it's not included uh, or they simply don't know. So I think the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, that's an interesting little poll. Indeed, I, I, I would also not expect uh, everybody to say we're doing enough because we can always do more, of course. Um, but uh, and I will just share my my slides, but I, I think that one of the things I want to do in this little uh, presentation is to disprove the, uh, the 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 suggestion I've heard several times that the European Commission isn't doing anything for um, circular economy and infrastructure and that we can concentrate too much on buildings. Um, of course, we do have a lot of policies on buildings, but as I think you will see, uh, we also have quite a lot that is relevant to infrastructure. Um, so I'm, I'm working in the construction unit in DG Grow. And um, in the construction unit, we are working uh, at the moment uh, uh, in when we define the construction ecosystem. Um, so this is slightly different to the definition of the construction sector. Uh, the ecosystem is a, is a definition that's slightly wider. Uh, it's based on the economic uh, indicators uh, using Eurostat and, 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 and sources like that. And um, 
the ecosystem is worth more or less 10% of the EU's gross value added. So it's one of the biggest of the 14 industry ecosystems uh, that are defined in the industrial strategy of the European Union. And it's as you can see, there has uh, millions of jobs and, and companies involved as, as we as we know, uh, small medium enterprises dominate construction. Then we have a statistic there on waste generated, and, and this is actually quite a new statistic that's came from Eurostat only uh, in September, because um, uh, for the last couple of years, we've been quoting the 2018 figure from Eurostat, which was 35.9% of the EU's waste generated came from construction. Uh, so it was already the single biggest source of waste, but that has unfortunately gone up rather than down. So the proportion is even bigger now. 37.1% of all of the EU's waste is coming from construction. So we have a massive waste problem. Uh, and also, of course, we, we have a problem with resource extraction uh, in construction. Um, the a piece of work that we're working on right now and we have been working on for the past year or so uh, is the transition pathway for construction. And uh, this is nearing the end of the process now. We've had many consultations. Uh, we've had many meetings with industry and with member states through the high level construction forum, bringing people together. We've had thematic sessions looking at various different aspects of this. Uh, and this transition pathway document we're drafting a final document at the moment, and it will come out uh, early next year. Probably at the moment we're looking at February. Uh, we don't have a specific date yet, but we're we're aiming for that kind of date. And what this document will do is um, uh, make recommendations for future action, not only for ourselves uh, at EU level, but also uh, recommend action at national level and, and industry. And, and these are not just our ideas, they're the suggestions that have come from all these consultations. One of the most important uh, policy developments now is the construction products regulation that is undergoing a revision. The um, proposal of the Commission was published in March and that is now going through the legislative process. It's being negotiated with the, the, the Council and Parliament uh, are laying out their opinions on this. Um, the, the the regulation is aiming or the, the revision is aiming to improve the functioning of the single market, first of all, uh, overall for construction products, but also for the first time integrate sustainability requirements. And, and here the circular economy is a really key part. And, and I will go into a little bit more detail here with this slide, because what this slide does is it picks out um, the, the various aspects of circular construction products and where and which articles and what we're talking about in the in the revision proposal. So overall, what we want to do is to make it easier for industry to be able to use uh, either remanufactured construction products or reused construction products and also ones with recycled content. Um, so this uh, there are various ways that this can be helped uh, to clarify the conditions for marketing of uh, construction products, including secondary ones, uh, to have uh, a protocols on dismantled products when buildings are demolished or ideally deconstructed and dismantled, there would then be a way for um, the people doing that to uh, follow a protocol that means that the products being dismantled can then be uh, more easily reused in future. Um, and then also information on um, product repairability and and possible reuse uh, and recyclability and so on. Uh, and then also one of the key things is is flexibility. So um, making it easier for products that maybe have undergone minimal change during the time when they were in the works, when they were integrated into a building or into a piece of infrastructure. Um, and then when the, that is uh, approaching its second life or ideally even third or fourth life, um, that that is uh, able to be marketed as a construction product in an easier way than would otherwise be the case. So they don't have to go through all of the bureaucratic process of a new product. And this is one of the key things uh, to level the playing field between new new products and uh, secondary products. Um, so uh, another thing there is permitting a second life. What that means is uh, surplus products that have been delivered to a building site but are not actually needed and never make it into the, the works. 
they at the moment very often just get wasted uh, and and this would uh, formally make it possible for them to be uh, to be used elsewhere uh, and then also um, uh, provisions there on closing material circles. Now um, we're also working on the uh, taxonomy uh, which you may have heard a lot about because there are already criteria for climate change and adaptation and mitigation which are published and in force since January. Uh, we have been working with the platform for sustainable finance, which is the, the kind of expert group uh, external uh, external to the Commission. Uh, and they've been uh, making recommendations on the further four criteria that you can see at the bottom there, including circular economy. So we've taken those suggestions on board and the Commission is looking at these now uh, with a view to publishing these criteria soon, uh, although we don't yet have a date for that. We have a study that is ongoing um, that is with us in DG Grow looking at uh, circular construction and how to measure it. So how to assess what is industry doing on the ground. So trying to look beyond national statistics, uh, things like Eurostat figures, which are very important, but which only give us a partial picture. We really need to know why uh, industry is applying circular approaches or why they're not doing it. And if not, uh, how can we uh, uh, open some bottlenecks and facilitate it? Um, so, so this study is looking at this in various ways. It's, or it's had some surveys, it's done workshops. It's going to soon conduct some interviews with key stakeholders uh, and there will be some ongoing work. It goes on until um, uh, spring next year, this survey, th this uh, study. And there's a website there to look at. Another initiative of DG Grow uh, is the Big Buyers Initiative, and this is aimed at uh, large procurers, so um, uh, national infrastructure bodies and also cities, people who have uh, procurement contracts. It has several working groups, including one on circular construction, which has actually been focusing especially on asphalt, which is, of course, absolutely key in infrastructure. Uh, and it has been making some links uh, between the procurers, looking at best practices, speaking to industry about what best practice is actually possible so that it can make it into uh, procurement contracts. So that is um, a very interesting uh, initiative there. And there's another working group, as you can see, on, on zero emission construction. Uh, there's a guidance document, in fact, two guidance documents which have been published since a number of years now by uh, the Commission. The uh, Construction Demolition Waste Management Protocol was published in 2016, so it's quite old, um, but it's still used and still relevant. And there's also from 2018 the guidance on waste audits before demolition. And we are aiming now, we've announced that starting next year, we're going to combine these two documents in a new revision, uh, looking at an, a new uh, updated management protocol for construction demolition waste and waste audits. And uh, this will also look at questions like asbestos and better reflect um, uh, uh, updated policies and more up-to-date case studies as well. So we'll be looking to work with uh, industry and stakeholders on this update. And finally, not to forget uh, the funding that uh, the Commission and, and the European Union makes available. We have, of course, the Horizon Europe programme for research and innovation. And in fact, uh, the work programme, the latest one, the 23-24 work programme, uh, the pre-publication of that has just gone online. So there are topics in there for circular infrastructure, um, if, if, you, if you look for them. Um, and then a much smaller program, but still relevant in, in some senses is the life program because uh, circular economy is uh, is part of that. And then we also have now a, a new development at the European Innovation Council, which is very interesting. They have a dedicated support for startups um, in uh, and SMEs in construction. So they have a, a specialist uh, program manager in construction who will help individual SMEs develop innovations uh, for construction. So that is uh, uh, a very welcome development there.
that was my last slide. I can just point you to our website for further information and also our LinkedIn group, uh, the construction ecosystem, where we sometimes post uh, updates on our work. And I'm looking forward to uh, answering any questions and taking part in uh, a Q&A later on. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Philip, uh, for this enlightening presentation. I think that a lot of people would change their opinion about um, infrastructure and the European policies. Uh, now you have explained us where to find them. Um, and I, I really believe that the infrastructure sector can uh, help with all their knowledge, etc., uh, to contribute to your studies and the update of the construction and uh, demolition uh, protocol. Uh, I think we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, Jessica from Rijkswaterstaat, can you maybe come up with a burning question from the audience? Yes, Agnes. Um, we have here a question posed by Evert Schoet, also from uh, Rijkswaterstaat. And uh, he's uh, very curious to know what kind of that, uh, what part of that 37.1% of uh, waste, demolition and construction waste, is uh, reused or recycled. So uh, whether there is information about that. Yeah, I think there's a separate Eurostat statistic about recovery rate of construction demolition waste. Um, so I'm not sure that that has been updated at the same time. I'd have to check, but um, there are, in fact, several statistics uh, that we keep an eye on uh, of Eurostat, but those are probably the two most important for circular construction are the waste generated and then the um, and, and then the other one I mentioned. OK, thank you. You um, and then uh, Philip, you mentioned uh, Horizon uh, Europe eh, uh, for also uh, for infrastructure uh, projects. Can you tell us a bit, little bit more about the timing? Uh, when are the next call for projects? Yeah, so the uh, work program pre-publication. What that means is it's it's not yet the official one, uh, but it's. Uh, very very close to the being the final version so they, they we wouldn't expect any any major changes uh, that has gone online as i said so um you can already see the topics in there um it will say in the work program um the the dates that the calls are expected to open it also says the budgets and and the deadlines and so on um what i'm talking about here by the way is cluster four of horizon europe that is the the part called um uh, digital industry and space and that has uh, this part we are working on for the digital and green transition of construction um, and there are more widely uh, other parts of horizon europe that might be of interest as well but of course it's it's a huge program so people would need to search for exactly what what their interest is okay uh thank you uh, i think we'll keep it here uh after this webinar uh, said there's a special digital room uh, the special chat where we uh, uh, where philip mostly will also be available so if you have any other questions uh, to him uh, you can definitely join us at four o'clock uh, for this i propose that we uh, continue with our program uh, to our next speaker um, we have the full context now the policy context and we can take a deep dive into the material cycles for the Two value change we have chosen today, concrete and asphalt. But before we are doing so, uh, Mr. Evert Schut, Schut from uh, the Dutch Rijkswaterstaat will bring us in the right mood, I would say. He will explain us the main principles uh, to take into consideration uh, for these two uh, value change. Change, sorry. Uh, Evert, please go ahead. Yes, I'm trying to share my screen now. Yeah. Yes, and here we are. Work. Yeah. And the presentation mode and then everything is perfect. OK, go okay, ahead. OK, good. Um, how do we close the loop for European supply chains in construction? Um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And um, just a quick introduction. I'm Evert Schurt. I'm a senior specialist circular economy working for Rijkswaterstaat, as already mentioned the National Roads and Waterways Authority of the Netherlands. In um, 2016, Rijkswaterstaat formulated uh, the ambition to be working in a fully circular manner by 2030. 
Um, by that time, we had basically no idea what this really meant, uh, which was good because we started a team to find out what it would mean and uh, eventually how to implement it. And um, one thing I'd like to say about uh, this, this search, that, that very soon we were um, convinced that we couldn't do this alone. This was not something just for um, inside Rijkswaterstaat. We'd have to do it with the whole value chain and probably not just within the Netherlands, but within uh, Europe. OK, let me start with an example with the with asphalt. Um, uh, one of the big problems which which I hear from my uh, asphalt uh, roadworks uh, colleagues is where do you get bitumen these days in Europe? It's 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 hardly produced anymore. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons. I'm sure we'll go into this uh, later. Uh, but but now it comes from countries which, um, well, are not always as politically stable as we would like. And so there's risks involved. On the other hand, um, there is already technically, uh, uh, it's, it's technically feasible to recycle asphalt at a high level, with which I mean from top layer to top layer, with recovery rates of, of 80% and more. Um, and in doing so, uh, recycling significantly contributes to lowering the carbon impact of asphalt. And um, there's also a new uh, development for uh, bio-based alternatives for bitumen. Uh, and they're, they're very promising, in at least in parts of, uh, of Europe uh, so far. So uh, all in all, more than enough reasons to go circular. Um, another example before I move on. Uh, this is um, a, a picture of uh, our circular viaduct, uh, a pilot project uh, built module in, in modules, as you can see uh, in the picture. And here the pilot was to, to test if we could construct it and deconstruct it uh, within the same year. And of course, if, if, it, um, if, if, it, if it worked as a, as a viaduct. Um, now, we have a lot of those. Uh, I think we have around 5,000 uh, viaducts in our network, and many of these need to be replaced in the next 20 years or so. Um, and that means that we want to go to, to market and, and ask um, a circular viaduct. Um, but does a manufacturer in, I don't know, uh, Italy or Lithuania know what we mean? And uh, more importantly, can they actually make it? Well, um, to answer that, I, I have to be a little bit more specific. Um, uh, and I'll just run through this. The viaduct needs to be designed for long lifespans, uh, adaptable, easily maintainable and repairable, detachable at construction element and material levels, that's for recycling purposes, uh, modular for reuse of elements, recyclable for full recovery of materials for the next life cycles. Um, and to do this, we need a common understanding of how to measure and assess circularity. Um, Philip Mosley already mentioned this. So, Philip, if you're interested, um, things are already happening uh, there. Um, how to actually design, build, maintain, repair, reuse and recycle a circular. Uh, viaduct, how to test materials, products, elements, and constructions for circular technical requirements, with, with which I mean things like adaptability, detachability, maintainability, etc., uh, and in different life uh, cycle stages. And, and finally, uh, but certainly not least, which information is needed for all those different life cycle stages? and from uh, who should this information come and how, how can you um, enable this uh, information flow? Okay, this all tends to point to one thing, in, at least in my mind, and this is uh, uh, technical standards um, within Europe. And the good news is there already is a, a SEND Commission TC350 Subcommission 1 on circular construction and uh, we, I'm, I'm a member of this commission, are working on general standards uh, with a framework, definitions, measuring circularity, that sort of thing, but also these technical circular standards, which we call horizontal because uh, they're sort of general standards which other technical commissions 
like, for instance, a commission on building bridges has to implement. Um, great, but will it be enough? Um, clients will become major suppliers of high quality resources for next generation circular constructions. And this, you, you have to let this thing sink in really. Um, it, it's a huge change. Right now, we as a client are not really interested in our waste. As long as it's handled uh, according to uh, Dutch laws, we're fine. Uh, and this has to change because we have to build new bridges, high quality uh, constructions from these waste materials. Uh, it's a completely new ball game and um, a, a big challenge for, for both industry and for clients like ourselves. So we need to sit down and work together to make this happen. Uh, and, and this is not just another linear supply chain as we've already uh, always done. It's 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 not even the chain. It's a it's a cycle. It's a value cycle. It's something new. But how? Well, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I just like to leave you with um, something that's inspired me a, a lot. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to be uh, a program manager for the Dutch Concrete Green Deal, which started in 2011. Uh, with a follow-up uh, in the Concrete Accord, I think it was 2016. And um, uh, one of the things I really liked about this, it was a private value chain initiative. There was no government to tell us what to do or even ask us anything. It was just their own initiative to start this. And um, I think it really helped to, to focus uh, the, the concrete sector on uh, sustainability priorities, uh, and eventually to make an actual deal with governments, both national and local, concerning things like specific carbon reduction goals, specifically recycling goals, circular design. And uh, it, I think it's inspired other initiatives uh, that are similar, at least, for asphalt, steel and timber uh, value chains. Uh, but the thing is, all of this is still at the Dutch national level. And the question I'd like to leave you with is, is this, should we start something similar at a European level? I hope so, that, that we can draw some conclusions in this direction at the end of uh, uh, this uh, circular talks uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Evert, for uh, this uh, insight into uh, the Dutch developments and uh, your uh, your view and uh, uh, call for cooperation. In, in fact, uh, you call for cooperation. It's not only a technical issue, but definitely also no. an issue of cooperating together in Europe and in the value chain. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, I think we have time for sh one short question, at least a short answer, uh, Evert. Uh, many participants in the audience uh, asked about the role of material passports. How could material passports support uh, the closing of the concrete and asphalt material loop? Yes, uh, excellent question. Uh, I completely agree. It's, it really is essential. And in fact, I already mentioned it in, in my presentation. Uh, I talked about information flows. And of course, the idea of material passport is, is what has inspired a lot of people um, uh, the um, the other word that's often used is um, um, uh, material logbooks because the idea of a passport is you're born with a passport. So, you know, somewhere a product is produced and then all the information is stored in a passport and it goes around the circle, uh, the life cycle, and that's it. But the idea of a circular logbook, uh, which um, I think is better because it um, all the new information in every step of the cycle is also included. So you get you really get life cycle information and the type of information. Well, it's very close. At least the first thing that comes to mind for me is those technical requirements, which I talked about. That's the thing you really want to know. You want to know how to deconstruct whatever product it is from the rest of the construction. That's that's the most important uh, sort of information you need. Uh, so yeah, that would be my answer anyway.
Okay, so definitely a clear rule uh, to introduce such uh, digital logbooks uh, in the value chain. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, Evert. Uh, I think we have a, a nice uh, background now uh, and we will take an even more deep dive into the concrete and asphalt chain, starting with the first panel, uh, which is about concrete. Uh, concrete, well, you all know, especially its cement, contributes significantly uh, to the European uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, it's therefore targeted in various European policies. Uh, we see it in the taxonomy, in all types of uh, sustainability policies. Um, and the sector, of course, also takes its responsibility there. Uh, many innovations are ongoing. Uh, you saw some examples already, but uh, we'll go deeper into it now, especially into the topic of high value recycling uh, of concrete, which means concrete back to concrete again and again. Uh, we have three very interesting panelists uh, on this topic uh, to give you the full and broad perspective of the benefits of cooperation uh, to achieve this uh, high value recycling. Um, and our first speaker, our first pitcher is uh, Dr. Mark Ottele. He's assistant professor at the Technical University of Delft. Uh, his research uh, is in the area of integrated durability. I'm reading now eh, because I can't learn this by heart. Integrated durability and sustainability of the building envelope, which explores the link and interaction between sustainability and durability. Uh, and the in this interaction uh, between materials and biology is central in his research and education. And, of course, he has lots of experience in high quality recycling uh, of concrete. So please, uh, Mr. Ottele, tell us all about this new developments and innovations on the technical side. Thank you, Agnes, uh, for your nice uh, introduction. Uh, so actually, I can keep it short uh, to introduce myself. Uh, but as Astrid uh, said, I'm working as assistant professor at Delft University um, uh, at this moment uh, full time. But in the past, I worked also uh, part time in the uh, industry, in the concrete industry in particular, um, as a consultant for a contractor. Um, so today I would like to focus actually a little bit more on uh, recyclability of concrete and um, to do so I have also a proposition and my proposition is actually that from the perspective of a circular economy the question is not what you can do with waste but how you can ensure that products materials and raw materials can be effectively recovered and reused in a subsequent cycle and I would like to tell you a little bit more about that and of course we can derive several stages where you can uh, reuse uh, constructions, of course, uh, on the building level, on element level, but at the end you have to uh, do something uh, at the end of life stage, so we would like to recycle it. But first I would like to propose as well that um, in, in terms of calculation, the environmental impact, I think there is a strong need in harmonization of the calculation methods. Um, and although I see improvement the last years in Europe, I think uh, it could be even better uh, that we go really to a system um, which all the countries has to follow in their calculation method, because we see that there is still a huge deviation in the approach to come to the result, which also make comparison between countries very complicated. And to my opinion, to embed as well uh, the improvements in the concrete industry, I think it is wise to take into account as well the shadow costs caused by building materials. And to my opinion, it should be embedded either in the cost price, but also in legalization of the product. And in the forecast of reusability, um, I think it is also very wise to stimulate actually the very long surface life, in particular for concrete, which is a very suitable material for it that we propose more um, in dealing in how to counteract actually the surface life and to keep it really for a long period in the chain because we can pick many benefits out of it where we can reuse it in multiple cycles after the uh, surface life. Um, but moreover, to, to keep the chain clean in separation, um, I think it is also very good to stimulate actually um, 
to keep those waste flows as clean as possible. And what I would like to mean with it, um, that is that uh, we can make use of a lot of secondary materials already in the market um, to use as a product in our concrete mixes. <clears throat> but we must be aware that we not introduce the asbestos of the future um, in terms of recyclability. So when we would like to recycle the material over 50 years, then it should be um, has a quality that it also generates added value at the end of the life stage. So in particular for cementitious binders, uh, I foresee in particular for the new modern recycling techniques that the added value is in particular in the retrieved binder system uh, based on the clinker. Um, so, and how does it look like? Because um, I worked also uh, in practice, I'm involved in several guidelines. I also uh, worked in the concrete agreement uh, concrete accord, as Evert uh, already mentioned, uh, where we uh, set already targets for the near future. For 2030, we obtained a uh, recyclability of 100 of the concrete waste, and that the waste flows are upcycled in such a quality that they are comparable with primary resources. And in particular, we see now a development over the last few years in modern recycling separation techniques in particular, who are able to separate really concrete to basic ingredients like sand, gravel, and a filler binder, the old cement, how I call it. Um, and although I have quite a lot of experience yet uh, with new place, the primary aggregates and sand with secondary retrieved uh, gravel and, and sand. And we are still seeking the opportunity to introduce the recycled binder. And I foresee, and I see that as well in our tech. are looking for new guidelines to implement also the recycled binder in new concrete and cement mixes. So I'm very happy to see that uh, the materials that we can derive, and you see on the right hand side a photograph of traditionally crushed concrete, uh, where we have sand, uh, cementitious material and aggregate still clocked together, while the modern separation techniques are able to separate almost clean aggregates in forms of gravel, sand, and also very fine fractions where we see that the old binder um, is well of a quality that differs, uh, which is also the challenge, of course, while we have a lot of different cement types in Europe. Um, however, it is uh, from an academic point of view, uh, research must be done how we can set the quality for the near future. So I have a, an implementation route for that uh, retrieve binder, and I foresee that in the upcoming years we can make use uh, of this binder in new concrete mixtures according to this implementation route. And finally, um, I think what is necessary as well for this implementation route is that we work more on passport and the fingerprint of products to, re to reuse actually, to determine the usability possibilities and to determine as well the value we have to work more on guidelines, I think, uh, which makes it able to reuse products um, and also how to calculate from a construction point of view. And furthermore, I think it is also very important that uh, the stimulation of concrete upcycling, as I said, so the waste flows that is fully 100% recyclable in the new stage, should be achieved instead of downcycling through traditional recycled aggregates or via the road foundations. So in particular in the old binder, there is the value in terms of environmental footprint. So for the near future, I hope that we can improve this um, on, well, really an international scale. So actually that brings me to the to short pitch, Agnes. So the floor Thank is yours Thank you very again. much, uh, Mark. It was very interesting and I heard you telling about uh, the standards. Uh, there, is a, there is a question on the Eurocodes, but I propose uh, that we first uh, do the three presentations uh, about concrete so that we have the full picture of the concrete recycling uh, area uh, and then 
uh, we'll come back uh, to the questions. So our next yes, picture, yes. thank you, Mark. And our next picture is Mr. Arthold from uh, Heidelberg Materials. And he's also the chair of the Concrete Sustainability Council. Um, welcome, uh, Mr. Arthold. Uh, the, the Concrete Sustainability Council. Uh, Concrete Sustainability Council initiative uh, paves the way, of course, to more sustainable concrete. And we were very eager to hear from you about the latest developments uh, to close the concrete loop. Mr. Arthur, thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much, Agnes. I'm working indeed with Heidelberg Materials, and I will share in a moment a presentation which uh, with you, which is about our work at Heidelberg Materials as well as about news from the Sustainability um, Council, Concrete Sustainability Council, just getting into the right presentation mode. Um, we at Heidelberg Cement are indeed working on closing the material loop uh, for concrete, but also for CO2. And I would say for you today, very important is the recycling part that we have engaged over the past few years. We see this on this slide here. So similar as Mark Ottele was just mentioning in his previous presentation, we are now at industrial scale really working on fully recycling concrete. So indeed with advanced, so we apply advanced um, crushing and sieving methodologies which are necessary to separate coarse aggregates from sand. And very, very important, as was just mentioned, to also separate the cement, the, uh, the cement paste. So the, the binder in the end to also get this recycled. Yeah. So with the coarse aggregate, basically, typically today, it's mainly used, unfortunately, still the recycled material for the sub-base of road applications, but increasingly in countries such as in particular the Netherlands, but also in Germany to uh, some extent, also thanks to the support of uh, DGNB certification system, it is increasingly used also in fresh concrete. Now, the sand, um, there are still limitations in most European countries uh, by standards. So in Germany, uh, for example, the use of recycled sand in uh, fresh concrete is not yet possible. Obviously, we very much hope that this is going to change. And now talking about the recycled concrete paste, we aim at using this, for example, in clinker production, or it can be also used after enforced carbonation, so uptake of additional CO2. It can be used directly in cement, in cement production in the cement mill as a secondary cementitious material. So this is ongoing work of our company. And uh, here you see such a pilot plant. Um, it is uh, an advanced crushing installation, which then separates coarse and fine aggregates and also uh, the recycled cement paste. Uh, we have uh, commercialized a number of uh, sustainable products, concrete products around the globe. Uh, with two focus areas in light green, you basically see the CO2 reduction versus baseline, which can be achieved. And in the darker green, you see countries where we are commercializing um, concrete with recycled content. The Netherlands is not here, but we have also commercialized with Ecocrete in the Netherlands, a product with up to 100% recycled aggregates. Here, the standards are a bit more in favor of this approach. To quickly jump to the Concrete Sustainability Council, that is, I would say, the FSC for concrete, um, and uh, which has developed a, a system, a certification system for responsibly sourced concrete. And on top modules here, one for low 
therefore carbon reduced concrete and another one for uh, re, uh, um, concrete with uh, defined recycled content. And uh, I would show you here that this label also permits to clearly uh, label your product, your recycled product with up to four stars, depending on the recycled content in the concrete. This was uh, introduced one and a half years ago with an update a few weeks ago and is uh, slowly gaining um, its way into the market, in particular in Germany, where this module has also been accepted by DGNB as a, as an, in, within one of their criteria to show, um, and apart from that, in the Netherlands. Yeah, with that, Agnes, I'm at the end of my presentation and I would hand it back to you. Thanks a lot for this, uh, showing us uh, this, uh, all these developments. Um, uh, and my question is, you mention often uh, Germany, where you yes. collaborate with DGMB, you mentioned the Netherlands, uh, uh, what we also heard from the first speaker, developments are ongoing, um, but we are talking about European cooperation uh, today. So what is your, do you have a view on how this is going in other European countries? Because CSC is in fact a global. Um, from, from the CSC perspective, the general rollout of CSC started in Central Europe and is no, now going also towards Eastern Europe. We have uh, certificates also in the Nordics, Latin America and the United States. If it comes to recycling, I would say the more east you go, the more difficult this is, in particular when we are talking about the use of recycled concrete aggregates in fresh concrete, so in other applications than okay. the road base. Okay, and uh, I just heard that, that we have a Polish representative in our audience, uh, Mr. Jakub Grubiak. Are you there? Because uh, maybe you can explain us a bit more about the situation in Eastern Europe, especially in Poland, on this recycling. Not sure. Is he here? Yeah. yeah. Ah, there you are. So oh. um, very interesting, eh, this uh, Dutch-German uh, developments. Uh, but we just heard the more east we go, the less of the more problematic it is to recycle. Can you explain us why? Yeah, hello everybody yeah that's 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 true uh, we are facing some challenges uh, for, yeah, in Poland for instance there is a little bit different level of waste concrete handling in compared to with the Western Europe where there is for instance quite um, <clears throat> common gate fee for instance for utilization of, of waste that are recycling entities or recycling units while in Poland uh, currently, the crushed waste concrete is utilized mainly as a road-based material, which was set uh, as well before on, as a weight white fractions by demolishers, which are recyclers at the same time. And so um, nowadays, in addition, the Polish market, aggregates market, is full of virgin aggregates, which are relatively cheap uh, and, and uh, have stable quality in compared to recycled aggregates for the concrete application. Um, but, however, for, you know, availability of that virgin aggregates is dropping down and will drop down uh, for, because of yeah, the availability of the land yeah, and, uh, of, um, and of the deposit itself is going down. So I believe and, and we can clearly see that the role of the recycled aggregates will grow. So I think that it's, it's all about the market yeah, for conditions and the balance between the, the costs and the prices, uh, so it will it will come. Uh, it will it will come. Okay, so uh, thank you. So not only technical but uh, economical aspect not to be forgotten. Uh, yep. Thanks a lot, and it I think it shows how important it is to cooperate in Europe uh, to spread technical knowledge, and then the market uh, will definitely follow. Okay, thanks a lot, and we go to our last speaker of uh, of this panel. Uh, I would say last but not least, Mr. Alexander Hoffman. He's Senior Vice President of the Transport Infrastructure Europe 
from Hochtief, a contractor, a big European uh, contractor. He's also a professor at the Hochschule Biberach. And uh, I believe I can say that you are more or less obsessed of this life cycle thinking and closing loops, uh, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, I think in this case, a very positive uh, attitude uh, to close the material cycles. And uh, you have a clear view on how European mechanisms can help. As we just saw, there's also a market perspective and you have a clear view on how it could work. So please take us through your uh, to your views. Thanks a lot, Agnes. Um, I'm trying to share my presentation and uh, wanted to start with uh, introduce myself, Alexander Hofmann, Hochtief PPP Solutions. I'm a civil engineer and an industrial engineer at the same time. 30 years in the business and I'm overseeing other activities in the uh, well, uh, if it comes to life cycle projects in the European market, especially the market in, in, in the Dach region and Benelux and with life cycle that comes typically together with DBFM contracts, PPP projects, conces concessions, things like that. Um, well, let, let's have a look at, uh, well, concrete. Uh, what does it consist out of? Well, most of it, it's aggregate. Uh, more than 80 percent and typically cement uh, volume is 12 to 14 percent and the rest is water and uh, this has some influence on the uh, on the carbon emission or carbon equivalent emission and if you have a look at the second circle here you see well most of the carbon that's uh, uh, produced or in connection with the uh, production of concrete uh, is, is due to cement and uh, Christian Adelt touched that. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to look at the other things like aggregate and transport and indeed in this area uh, which is more or less 4% 4, 4 each uh, we can do better than we did in the past by recycling the materials by recycling the aggregates. Well uh, recycling the aggregates in the past means you um, well, um, if you had fresh concrete, which has been transported by track mixers and it was not used on site, you bring it back to the mixing plant and at the mixing plant, it will be washed with water and then you have aggregates that are alike new. But what are uh, what about the aggregates that has been or the concrete which has been built in in bridges and tunnels and things like that? Well, typically, if we recycle the material, we crack them down and we bring them then to uh, to rock crushers. And in these rock crushers, you have a high pressure on this material. And uh, typically, the aggregates already have some hairline cracks. And with these crushers, these hairline cracks increase in numbers and size. And this, this makes these aggregates less being useful for material which needs to be uh, needs to be used in an in a frost area so from a frost um, resistance point of view this material is not is not the best one um, but it, it can be used and if we would find out new solutions how to separate the, the concrete paste from the aggregates we would uh, produce material which is alike the virgin material or even better and this is uh, where we put some investigation on and trying to to develop that and how can we do that well we can do that if we have the opportunity in the market and the opportunity on projects where we can use or the, the recycling material and if you have big projects uh, where we typically um, to rebuild all bridges or we have to build new bridges instead of the existing bridges uh, which are non, no longer sufficient for for being used then typically you would bring a new material to build the first bridge but uh, starting with the second bridge where's the opportunity to use the old material of the first bridge then you could use the the, the material of the second bridge which has been tiered out to produce the third bridge and so on and the bigger the project is the bigger the uh, your volume is in size the more opportunities you have to optimize that but to optimize that it needs some stimulation and uh, by the market or by the client and this brings me to the to the second point uh, if we, if we see 
uh, criteria in the uh, uh, competition, in the uh, evaluation, in the procurement process, uh, then typically competitors or people who are in that market would optimize their bids. And this could be done by either you, you give quality points to uh, sustainable behavior, um, which means, yeah, it's, it's less transparent than you have concrete numbers. And uh, this is the second topic, uh, which is my thesis, internalized costs. So if everything would have the right price, also regarding our construction, then we would come to, um, um, to a system where we would have more simulation for use or reuse recycled materials. And how could that be introduced? Well, that's not so difficult. Typically, you could use the, the original bid price, the original cost or the normal cost, and you could add, add um, the, the volume on carbon or carbon equivalents that are which comes together with the use of these materials and the, and the construction process. And you can base that on the greenhouse gas protocol. So we already have a system where we can find the proper uh, numbers in terms of carbon consumption or carbon which has been produced and is uh, um, uh, putting negative impact on our world. And then the, the second part of that is we need to come to right pricing. And for example, the, the Umweltbundesamt in Germany comes out with numbers how big the damage is on one ton uh, carbon or one ton carbon equivalent, which is at this point of time 195 euros. And uh, if we would install a system like this, and I see more and more clients being open for, the, for a system like this, then we would have a competition between being more sustainable or having a cheaper price. And if, if this system will be installed, um, the optimum out of that would be awarded and the company who is bringing the best solution for that would uh, would be awarded with the uh, with the contract and uh, by introducing such a, a system we would stimulate not only the use of recycling material for concrete but um, for being more sustainable at all and this is something where the eu could be maybe even more by making this number 195 or even higher uh, a number which is accepted by the national audit offices. So far, Agnes, for the first impression. Many thanks, many thanks. Uh, that's an interesting proposal, this, of course, uh, doing uh, the pricing. Um, and uh, do, do you think it will uh, result in an increase of high quality recycling of concrete? So what we saw uh, uh, shown by Mr. Ottele and uh, Mr. Artold with uh, regaining all the fractions out of it. Um, it also costs uh, costs some energy. So uh, maybe yeah, maybe the, C the CO2 yield is uh, is not that much. And will it then really uh, be an impulse for contractors to go to high quality recycling? I can or always. I can only speak for my company. It, it will be a stimul stimulation, uh, definitely. And we already have to deal with uh, several, uh, several ingredients in our price, which is design, construct, financing, operate and maintenance. maintenance. And if sustainability issue would come on top in terms or by, by a certain price, we would optimize it at all. And this is not a big deal to do so. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Um, then we go to questions from the audience. And I think there was a question on the Eurocodes for Mark Ottele. Jessica, could you please tell us more about this question? Yes, definitely. So this question is uh, from Simon uh, uh, McGuinness. I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm pronouncing it that well. Um, but it it, uh, it indeed concerns uh, the Eurocodes revision, uh, and uh, he asks whether um, the ongoing revision will clarify the difference between the very short structural design life 
uh, of buildings and the proposed use life of built assets, uh, which is significantly longer. Um, he further continues by saying millions of buildings in Europe are in daily use and are over 500 years old. So structural designers need to embrace the concept of circularity and the Euro codes are currently preventing that by setting artificially short design uh, life. Um, I'm not sure whether you, you're, you're able to answer that. Maybe that's a question more to Philip, but um, I'm curious uh, to know the reactions. Yeah, uh, let's see, Mark, uh, could you give an answer or? Y yes, maybe, uh, well, maybe I, can, I can try to answer the, the, the question eh? because uh, indeed, of course, the Euro code, but the Euro code is more or less written for uh, the new design of new construction. So, so the new design approach. Um, although I'm happy to see already in that new approach that uh, the performance based design uh, method is also introduced in the new Euro code. Uh, which, uh, to my opinion, is also necessary to uh, to make the first step in in more uh, um, how can I say it more uh, functional design uh, hand in hand with sustainability and durability. So with respect to for building stock, then um, of course the the new Euro code is always. Um, well, has new insights in, in stiffness and strength, etc. So you calculate actually existing constructions uh, uh, not to the new standard. That means actually that other codes or guidelines, uh, to my opinion, should step in uh, to, to take into account with other methods to determine if the uh, remaining service life is still uh, appropriate for the new uh, functional unit, uh, so functional performance that you would like to derive. So probably other uh, assessment methods should be introduced. Okay, so still some work uh, to do there. Uh, yeah, there's still work to do. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I see that in the chat uh, there are also some uh, support uh, chats uh, for the other speakers, but uh, for now I would say uh, let's let's close this panel uh, on, on concrete and let's go to the next panel discussion, which is uh, on asphalt. Um, asphalt is a very interesting material. Uh, we already heard from uh, Evert Schut that uh, bitumen is becoming scarce. At the same time, it's very well recyclable and a valuable material. Um, probably not even necessary to price it uh, as Mr. Hoffman uh, suggested because asphalt producers may want to have it as an alternative for primary bitumen and uh, our first speaker is from the European uh, Asphalt Association EAPA uh, and I think this webinar is very timely since uh, Bridgeo Gomez will tell us all about the viewpoints of EAPA and the uh, what they lay down in their latest position paper, and it's a call to close uh, the material loop for asphalt. Uh, please tell us more about what your sector is looking for. So thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, magnificent introduction. I think you are able to see my screen now and to, to see me and hear me well. So thank you for the also the, the invitation to be in this um, in this webinar. And I would like to just briefly introduce a bit what is this circular economy of asphalt and some issues that from the European Asphalt Pavement Association we have been uh, finding and the recommendations we have been providing. So as you know, asphalt is this black material that we put on the surface of more than 90% of roads in Europe. And we do it for many reasons, as you can see in that list from uh, comfort, low rolling resistance, uh, skid resistance, so safety, uh, good drainage and, and so on and so forth. But we have a very good reason as well to use it nowadays under the current um, circumstances, which is there is a material that is 100% not just recyclable, but actually 100% reusable as well. So in fact, and if we see the, the this pyramid or this hierarchy established by the uh, European Waste Framework Directive, we can see that asphalt is uh, if we start from the top, it's a, it's a material that is durable, but actually it's also easy to repair. So 
with proper maintenance and so we, we can even extend much more the, the service life. Even when we uh, still when we reach the end of the life, asphalt is 100% reusable and then of course as well 100% recyclable. We do this differentiation because we call it reuse when we take the asphalt, asphalt from an old road, for example, and we use it again as asphalt in a new road. So we can remelt, let's say, if you allow me this, this term, we can remelt the, the binder and use it again as asphalt or, or replacing new asphalt, let's say. So we are not using so much new asphalt because we're using the old one uh, instead. And this is what we call reuse. Um, and then, of course, we can recycle recycle it as something else. For example, a granular material that we can use in landfilling. Oh, sorry, in uh, in backfilling or in the um, or as a, I don't know in a, in a granular layer for road construction or any other any other place. The, so that would be what we call recycling. And with these uh, considerations, the data that we have, the most recent, we publish every year the data of the sector, and we have been seeing that. Uh, from the, the reclaimed asphalt or the, the side one asphalt that we have from uh, available for the industry, we the, the industry is nowadays uh, reusing around two thirds of this material and recycling around one third, which means that we have been seeing that only around five percent around different years, but around one five percent is what is being put to landfill. And this, uh, as you can uh, imagine, is uh, directly putting asphalt in the front row of uh, circular economy when it comes to construction materials, at least. Um, still, we have some considerations. As I said, asphalt is a construction material that is easy to repair, and with this, we can really extend the service life. For us, this should be the step zero. Before even starting to think about reuse, recycling, and everything, the first thing we need to do is to have a proper maintenance of the roads that we already have. And we are finding that some administrations prioritize building new roads that are spending the money on that, that actually spending the money in preserving the infrastructure that we already have. So one of the ideas, uh, the first idea what we want to launch is that before doing anything else, we need to uh, extend the service life of what we have as much as possible. Then indeed, when we come to the, to the end of life, uh, the, the first option should be reuse and the last option should be recyclable. In fact, in, in, in the asphalt industry, we say sometimes that for us, recycling is not even good enough because we have other things that we could do first. We have to to maximize the reuse. Recycling is almost the, the last option we can do. Of course, the last is put into landfill, but for us, it's, it's becoming not even an option anymore. So, um, and it, when we come to, to reuse and recycling, we have seen that there are, there are some historical misconceptions of new better, being better than reuse and, and so, and also the application of the waste framework directive that can lead to some uh, difficulties in terms of end of waste to uh, classify the, mat the material as non-waste. So it's been a bit, uh, it's making the, the, the reuse and recycling uh, difficult sometimes. Um, and this often uh, can be translated into special operating procedures, which can, which can reduce efficiency in the process, increase costs, and at the end of the day is well, uh, not very encouraging to, to do it more. So we need to reduce these barriers, I will say, to, to, to do better. And also there is another thing, an important thing, is that some administrations with the aim or of actually being very circular and, and sustainable, we tend to um, urge in um, recycling materials or waste materials and byproducts from other industries into asphalt. And we have identified some cases that these materials into asphalt can endanger the circularity of the asphalt itself. So we have to be very careful with this because something that can look very circular actually is linear because it just comes from a different industry to ours and from ours to a landfill, a material that otherwise could be reused for several, several cycles actually. So we have to be also very careful with this. So in order to present this in a, in a good way for the public and for the administrations, uh, we have published this year this document a few months ago where we where we show our position and give some recommendations to achieve these goals. So our position is basically uh, with what I have been commenting that uh, as long as it's technically economically viable, proper road maintenance must be carried out to maximize the service life of all roads. This is the step zero before anything else. 
Then, of course, when it comes to an end of life, the first option is reuse and then recycling. But asphalt should never be considered waste. This is our big position. And also be careful, as I said, with these waste materials and byproducts from other sectors that may endanger the circularity of asphalt. In terms of recommendations, uh, basically stimulate the demand for these uh, sustainable options, including the use or the reuse of asphalt and, and of, of the existing material that we already have before new material to set up regulatory plans in which asphalt is never considered waste and establish reasonable end of waste criteria. So even if it's waste at some point, we can reverse that easily to produce robust specifications designed to maximize circularity in the road sector, to prevent introduction of waste materials and byproducts from other industries, which could compromise fundamental characteristics of asphalt and to adequately manage asphalt with legacy materials. And I don't have time now in this short introduction, but uh, this is also some something very, very important for us. I don't know if maybe later in the Q&A or so. So this is a, a bit what I wanted to, to introduce. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel. And uh, it's, it's great uh, to hear that uh, the sector is so active in uh, trying to get back material, uh, to prolong the life cycle and, uh, and finally to get it back and reuse the material. Uh, we uh, sometimes say high quality recycling, but in fact, it's a material uh, reuse what we are talking about. Uh, we come to the questions later on. Uh, I first want to uh, continue to, uh, to our next uh, picture, which is uh, Dr. R Richard Gosling. He's researcher at Wageningen University. He's an expert in bio-based uh, materials, and he will explain us all about innovative uh, binders for asphalt and uh, how European cooperation can help us there to make the shift from uh, the scarce fossil bitumen to bio-based alternatives. Richard, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Agnes, and, uh, and welcome to this, uh, to this webinar. And thanks for inviting me for that. My name is Richard Gosling. I am working at uh, Wageningen Food and Biobased Research, uh, part of Wageningen University uh, as expertise leader, and we try to develop innovative uh, solutions for the uh, infra uh, sector, uh, not only on asphalt, but also on concrete. But for this talk, I'm, uh, I'm more diving into the content of bio-based asphalt. I hope you can see my, uh, my slides. So what we developed today is that um, in the Netherlands, we have developed a technology where we can use lignin as one of the largest side streams from the pulp and paper industry as a substitute for bitumen at 50% substitution level, uh, which is already at uh, TRL level 6 to 7. Uh, that patented technology uh, has resulted in more than 30 demonstration roads already in the Netherlands. Next to that, we also have a technology where we can also substitute part of the bitumen up to 50% substitution level um, by blending first and then add it to an asphalt uh, mix at uh, a lower TRL level, but that is also one of the technologies which has been developed uh, recently. Um, next to that, we're not only looking at combinations between lignin and bitumen, we also look at substituting uh, full bitumen by bio-based alternatives. And that is really under development. Uh, we have currently a project where we do the coordination um, in the coming years, uh, a TKI project, uh, we also have a Chaplin program where also uh, the development of bio-based alternatives to bitumen are uh, being developed. And we also submitted a EU proposal uh, this year, uh, some months ago, ready to stimulate the cooperation in Europe about the development of uh, sustainable binders. And hopefully that will be uh, granted next year. So why are we looking into sustainable alternatives for bitumen? Well, already the previous speakers uh, told about us uh, about that. Eh? We would like to be independent on fossil resources uh, and also on the geopolitical effects for the supply of bitumen. And we already see there a trend that less bitumen is becoming available. Uh, also, the trend for more sustainable roads is really important to mention. And one of the criteria for having a more sustainable road is that we also uh, store biogenic carbon for a long time, a long time, and long period in in the road. 
so that helps a lot in uh, developing a sustainable um, pavement for the future. Then we also have to look at several selection criteria. And we are talking about a huge market, a huge uh, use of, of bitumen. So we also need a large supply of biobased raw materials. And that is something we, we can only solve in, in a European context, not only in one country, but we need a European um, a collaboration in that. Uh, prefer we would like to use side streams, eh, which, which are available on, on, in large scale and do not compete, for instance, with, uh, with food. Um, also, if we develop new and novel binders, it should be compatible with the recycling process, which is uh, currently uh, the status in, uh, in asphalt recycling. And we should uh, benefit from the lower environmental footprint. In Nellis, we started this journey uh, already about 10 years ago. And really, we're starting from the lab and we built in uh, 2015 our first uh, demonstration road of 70 meters only with a 50-50 lignin bitumen binder. And that road is still laying there in a good condition. Um, anno 2022, we have more than 30 demonstration roads. Uh, uh, provincial roads, uh, longer roads, uh, lower, uh, shorter roads, cycling path, so several uh, different types of roads. As said, we have two patented technologies which we can use for that. And we also see that if we do the calculation, we really see that uh, this technology uh, deliver a much lower carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of asphalt, so between 35 and 70 weight percent. So that's really, really a lot. And currently, because of the increased prices of bitumen, also the alternative binder is already cost competitive. In the Chaplin projects, uh, we also demonstrated not only uh, in the top layer, the new binder, but also in, in other layers and also in combination with uh, recycled asphalt, which is of course very important if you um, have the transition of novel binders into the current system of recycling. So um, one of the roads uh, paved in October 2020 was made there with three different layers of bio asphalt. So with a novel binder, but also in combination with wrap uh, in the top layer, in the bind and also in the base layers. Um, most of the time we use craft lignin as a bitumen replacement because that's uh, the lignin which is available the most. But also other biorefinery lignins are coming into, pl into play because more factories are generating by refinery lignins. And if you talk about recycling, we also see that the lignin based asphalt binder can be recycled from the old aged road in 2015. And that was really uh, the first time we successfully tested that uh, aged binder. So if you look at the uh, closing the material cycles, as said, we are talking about a huge market of bitumen. So we need uh, large side streams. Uh, one of that could be lignin, because uh, currently uh, worldwide there is a lot of lignin extracted from wood, but also other lignin cellulosic uh, feedstocks to produce paper. And the leftover is the lignin. Um, also other industries for the uh, production of uh, cellulosic ethanol, for instance, they produce a side stream of lignin. So that means that a lot of lignin could become available for this application. Um, also, we should maintain uh, the recycling rate. So that means that we should have a compatible system between the novel and the old binders. Uh, that that uh, paves the way to a tradition of more sustainable binders. And we also have a secure of supply if we uh, are not only dependent on the fossil resources, but also uh, can use the, um, uh, the new feedstocks. How would we further uh, include that and, and implement those new binders? Is that there is also a need for harmonization of, uh, of protocols, how to, um, how to, to, to test the, the different binders, how to exchange information. Uh, can we use the, the mixed designs in different countries, in different climates? And we really need more data on the user phase uh, by using and making a lot of demonstration routes. So that will help us in further validation of the technology. And last but not least, we would really like to, uh, to encourage partners to further develop together with us uh, this technology in different countries. 
and to uh, further monitor those roads which we are going to pave with this technology of 50% replacement of bitumen or the 100% replacement of bitumen. And by that I close my uh, initial talk. It's great to hear about uh, this uh, innovations uh, you are working on, uh, Richard, and uh, your call upon cooperation in Europe, uh, which is in fact uh, the theme of today. Uh, so very good. Um, I hope in the audience they've listened carefully to you and uh, approach you uh, to cooperate. Um, so we heard about policies, we heard about innovations, uh, and there we come to our last picture, which is uh, Dr. Uh, in engineer Rien Huurman from uh, Asphalt, Asphalt Nu, uh, which is literally translated as Asphalt Now. He's the uh, first Dutch independent asphalt producer and an expert in sustainable asphalt mixtures. So he already works on material reuse and new mixtures and closing the material cycle for asphalt. He has also a lot of hands-on uh, experience uh, from practice and uh, also on European European cooperation and he exactly knows what should further be improved uh, in our cooperation in the value chain to further close uh, the asphalt cycle. Uh, Rien Huurman, uh, go ahead, floor is yours. Okay, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you Agnes for your uh, introduction. I will proceed without introducing myself further with my first slide. Uh, basically uh, sharing with you the necessity of uh, of change, the necessity of a, of a, a transition process in our uh, field. Asphalt needs to become more circular, climate neutral, the emissions need to be reduced, and the quality of asphalt and thus the durability of asphalt need to be uh, as high as possible. Uh, basically every client has uh, these, uh, these goals in uh, uh, similar ways. And the goals are set for 2030 and 2050. And of course, the boundary conditions is euros. As you can see, these goals are all a result of a inconvenient uh, truth that was uh, basically thrown into the world in, two, in uh, 1972, for instance, by the report limits to growth. And following 2015-2016, uh, the Paris Treaty, it became more and more uh, uh, important to really make this transition to a uh, more sustainable asphalt uh, supply chain. Uh, our uh, company in the period 2013-2016 16 did, a, did a, uh, a European project with the help of a Life Plus uh, grant, and the project was basically aiming on uh, yeah doing what is needed, uh, trying to fulfill all these goals by making a pavement that was circular, uh, more climate neutral, uh, reducing emissions strongly and at high uh, quality. And uh, important factors in that project were, first of all, not reusing asphalt, but, uh, but uh, separation of uh, raw materials from asphalt and reuse these uh, obtained uh, fresh materials or uh, uh, reused uh, materials, components, also, like uh, this was done in the concrete industry, separating basically the aggregates from the binder, the binder being a mortar. And only the binder needed to be heated to 135 or 110 degrees Celsius. As you can see back then, we made use of uh, a temporarily extension of our asphalt plants by higher uh, equipment. And that, of course, is not the way you want to proceed. We want to proceed by building a new plant, enabling us to do this, what we did in 2013 and 2016 on an industrial scale. But to get there, we have some blind spots that we have to uh, overcome. The first blind spot is uh, the importance of the municipalities. We are discussing Europe, but perhaps we should also look at a, at a much smaller scale. Here you can see that the Dutch road network is a dense net network and that 20% of the produced asphalt is delivered to the National Road Authority, 20% is delivered to our provinces, and 60% of the produced asphalt is delivered to the municipalities. Of course, we have one National Road Authority, we have 12 provinces, and we have 345 uh, municipalities. This implies that per municipality, on average, they have 0.17% of the market, 
the provinces on average have 1.7 percent per uh, road authority of the market and of course our national road authority in its own has 20 percent uh, this implies that knowledge the knowledge required to make the transition at the municipalities is more than 100 times more expensive per ton of asphalt than at the national road authority and then if you take into account the whole system that needs to be brought into a transition mode it is really huge we have 28 asphalt plants and if we include the water boards 376 public road authorities they all need to make this transfer from what we do today to what needs to be done tomorrow. Another blind spot is the TCL. Focus in our industry is on the TRL, the technology readiness level, but in a commercial environment, uh, developing a technology is not enough. The technology has to, be, uh, has to be implemented, has to be used to make an impact on the environment, has to be used to close uh, business cases. Mitre, uh, uh, an, a non-profit organization helping the American uh, uh, public entities to uh, implement uh, innovations came to the conclusion that there is a multidimensional framework that is required to manage the success of these transition and, and innovation projects and that this multidimensional framework uh, should consider both the technology and the com transition commitment level. Uh, if there is no transition commitment level, of course, developing technology will lead to uh, a report on a shelf. Then there is no market. Like I said, we want to uh, we want to make the step from what we learned in 2013 and 2016 by the help of the uh, Life Plus brand and transfer what we did then uh, into an, uh, a full scale asphalt plant. We want to do that in 2023. But uh, we understand and we, 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 we worry about the blind spots that we have. And my basically my pitch is about that perhaps it is not the technology that is limiting us. Perhaps it is the lack of TCL that is limiting us. And I want to end my uh, pitch by uh, uh, a graph, which is a vehicle with two steering wheels. This is the situation in which we are sitting according to Mitre. We as a company, we want to sit on one of uh, at these uh, front seats, take control of the steering wheel and bring us forward. But the question is, who is going to sit on that other steering wheel? Where is the TCL? Who is the leading uh, client bringing us forward? That is a question. I think the answer to that question is very important in successfully transferring the asphalt industry from what it is today to a truly sustainable circular industry. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you very much, uh, Reen. Uh, I think uh, a lot comes together in, in your call for cooperation. Uh, uh, since uh, Brecho uh, Gomez also mentioned uh, the importance of all the authorities, including all the authorities, uh, should have a look in, in, in towards, what, what, into good solutions uh, for asphalt. Uh, and it's not only about uh, technologies, but also it's the soft side uh, of life, uh, which is so important that we cooperate and have the willingness to act uh, together. Um, and also uh, uh, the big bias initiative uh, mentioned by Philip Mosley in the, in the beginning might be, a, might be a nice opportunity here uh, to introduce new techniques and new concepts, which are so well developed in all these European uh, projects to bring them to the to the more regional uh, authorities. Thanks a lot. Um, we have time for some Q&A. And I think that was a question for Mr. Gomez, uh, Jessica, wasn't it? Uh, already at the start. Yes, I think uh, two questions uh, to Brescio. Uh, the first one being, what is the difference between the reuse and recycling when it comes to CO2 and uh, nitrogen uh, emissions? And the second one um, uh, from Evert, do you agree with the observation that it is becoming very difficult to acquire bitumen from within Europe? Okay, let's let's do uh, them one by one. First question, uh, Brescio, uh, did you have a look into the environmental impact, CO2, uh, 
nitrogen emissions uh, for different options? Well, the nitrogen emissions are quite uh, specific and I don't have the, the value here. Um, but in general, I would say that everything depends a bit of, of the case and what we do. No? It's, uh, it's, different to, it's difficult to generalize. Uh, the, I mean, even something that we have in this publication is that it, for certain applications, reuse or recycling might not be the most sustainable option. For example, if we have to bring the material from very far and just next to it, I have a, a quarry. If we do the proper life cycle assessment and then with the corresponding EPD and everything, maybe we find out that it is not the best option. So in general, I don't like to extract like very general um, numbers, but uh, unfortunately for the specific case of nitrogen, I, I don't have any any answer at the moment. I'm, I'm sorry. No problem, but uh, it's definitely something uh, to look into. And it, it also hurt uh, this life cycle assessment approach uh, and, and the probably uh, that extra transport might be at stake uh, in, in the concrete uh, panel. So definitely uh, when closing uh, the material loops, we should definitely ensure that also the environmental impact um, comes lower and not higher in this end. OK, and the other question to you, uh, Rachel, was um, the scarcity of bitumen. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I mean, what we are seeing nowadays is, um, well, the situation is changing. Uh, we have seen disruptions in supply chain of different raw materials. Bitumen is one because it, it, it because it comes from crude oil. And indeed, uh, for example, Russia was uh, one of the, the, the big players here and uh, we don't have that anymore. So uh, a lot of the logistics had to change. Um, when we see the future, well, we are seeing that the policies somehow they're pushing us to to find alternatives as we have seen in the previous uh, uh, um, presentations as well and uh, and it, of course circular economies is one of the solutions for that if we if we can maximize the use of the the material that we already have in our roads instead of bringing it from other regions from out of europe and so so because we already have it in our roads and maybe the extra material that we still need to to add fresh or new we could maybe do it with sustainable uh, technologies, for example, these bio binders or so. Maybe then we can uh, have a 100% uh, optimized solution. But uh, we, I would say that we are still far from that. But uh, I, I don't know exactly how the future would look like exactly. But um, I think uh, circular economy will, will play a fundamental role because we, we have already studies that we can reuse up, up to 100% of the mix is not the most efficient thing at the moment, and uh, but some companies are already with very high rates and, and of reuse. So as I said, if then the remaining part, we can even do it with something different is uh, why not? Yeah, so. Okay, and uh, that brings me then to a question uh, to Richard Gosselink, uh, because that uh, bio-based uh, binders are part of the solution uh, as we hear. What, uh, what do you need then to scale up this application uh, and maybe both the technical side and soft side uh, this uh, willingness also uh. yeah we heard already that both are important well from the from the technical part i would say that we um, we are uh, stepping into this development already for uh, for quite some time but still need a lot of of data uh, also data from the practice uh, how to uh, uh, how do the um, the binders uh, behave in in practice. Uh, what is their technical uh, performance? So that is something we need to um, uh, to further continue, and also in different countries. Uh, it is not only uh, we know quite a lot about the situation in in the Netherlands, but that's not the same as in the Nordics or in in Spain. So we really need to harmonize those um, data. Uh, we need to uh, further monitor the different different roads, demonstration roads in uh, in different countries. And there's another thing is that also uh, the use of novel and new materials in those cycles should be further stimulated by the authorities and by the regulations. Um, can we use those new materials in, um, in the current uh, pavements? I think that's also something to further harmonize and decide on the European level uh, how to deal with that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um... So there are some routes uh, for forward uh, to go forward, and uh, we heard from Mr. Herman also that there is some hurdle with the willingness here and there. But Mr. Herman, um, 
So all these options that you heard, uh, the standardization uh, involving uh, uh, regional authorities, more demonstration projects, various countries. What would be the right order to develop and implement all these options? Uh, could you give a recommendation on that? Uh, yeah, what I uh, what I miss a lot is uh, backward uh, scheduling. Uh, we know we have goals uh, set for 2030 and 2050, and if you want to meet those goals uh, and you have an understanding uh, of your technology, you can do backward scheduling and come to the conclusion that perhaps today we already know that we are not going to meet the goals for 2030 and 2050. One example for this is uh, 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 searching for asphalt with a much longer lifespan. Of course, this is highly beneficial. We should always do this because the best asphalt that you can produce is asphalt that is not produced at all. But if you take into account that uh, uh, an average uh, Dutch road, net, uh, road would have a lifespan of 27 years for the binder and, uh, and, and, and lower layers, and perhaps 13, lay, 13 years for the surface layer. On average, that is a lifespan of 20 years. If we spend four years, which is a PhD project, on doubling the lifespan of asphalt, it gives us the first four years. Then this technology needs to be evaluated. Uh, 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 that will take uh, another four or five years, monitoring the behavior of a pavement. That brings us to eight years. Then this technology has to be fed into industry. Asphalt plants have to be adopted uh, another 10 years. Then following this whole period, we will be busy for 20 years replacing asphalt with an old life service life. So that brings us 30 years away from where we stand now. So if this would be an example, you know that investing in lengthening the service life of asphalt will not bring us to 2030 or 2050. It is too little too late because a double lifespan will only reduce the CO2 emissions by half. On the other hand, if you do something that has an effect right now, and uh, yeah, it, it will be beneficial from the start. So I think I see not often enough backward scheduling. I think that is something that we should implement in everything we do. Um, it is so important. Time is of the essence. Um, money is limited. People are limited, laboratory capacity is limited, skills are limited. We need to do the correct thing. That basically is uh, what I want to say. Great, it's also very, uh, a very good recommendation, I think, for all the research projects for the next years that we shouldn't forget to already apply what we have on innovations uh, today. That's a very good point. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, the last question will be from the audience. Uh, Jessica, I think there's a question from for Mr. Gomez. Uh, yes, and the question is coming from uh, Luis Afonso and uh, he wants to know about the current uh, position of uh, EAPA with regards to uh, the addition of asphalt mixes. Uh, and he continues uh, even reused uh, other products coming from other sectors such as waste from from the end life uh, of tires and plastics. Um, according to him, this um, apparently, um, this introduction has shown improved technical performance for asphalt um, that have um, uh, for asphalt mixes as well as a useful life. Um, I'm not sure I, I, I fully understood the question. I, I think it's our position regarding the use of these materials into asphalt into asphalt mixes, uh, waste materials from other sectors, I guess. Um, it, I don't know if I, if I can write. I okay. believe so too. Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, if that's the, the, the case, uh, it's a bit what I introduced in, in my presentation. Um, what we want to prevent is that uh, when we, I mean, we are not against the, this uh, initiatives of uh, recycling waste materials or byproducts from other industries into asphalt. In fact, some technologies have been already used for many years, for example, the use of ground rubber you know, from, from old tires and things like that. Um, what we are a bit concerned is that sometimes moved for by the trends that we have nowadays, um, there are certain authorities, policymakers, uh, 
administrators that have a lot of urge to do something because um, because it is it's popular, let's say sometimes. No, so they're pushing the technology a bit uh, too fast, and we need to to be sure that what we do doesn't have an impact in in the future as well. And the performance of the mix, in the health and safety, in the recyclability or reusability of the, the mix at the end of life, and so on and so forth. So a proper risk assessment has to be done. We have a publication in the app specific for this that I recommend everybody to to read. So thank you for the question in this regard. And uh, and yeah, because uh, we have seen it, for example, quite recently with the with the case of plastics, with plastic waste. Some plastics are very promising, and we there are literature reviews with uh, hundreds uh, or more than one hundred of projects indicating that there is potential for that. Other plastics, we know that they are not good because, for example, when we hit them, there is some health and safety issues with some compounds and so. And others we basically don't know. And so what we need is a bit of patience. We want to do it, we are working on that, but uh, it's not something that we can do from one day to the other without assuming important risks for operators, for people passing around and safety of the roads and everything. So we are working on that. There is a lot of research being done, a lot of trial sections with many different uh, byproducts and waste materials. But uh, we have to be careful. This is what I want to say. And this is our okay. position. Okay, that, that, and it's good to hear. And uh, a little patience, of course. We, what you yes. just heard from Mr. Human is that we also have to start with what we already know uh, that we should do it already today. Okay, thank you. Uh, many thanks to our panelists and our audience. Um, and before we come to the conclusions of this webinar, we have another slide poll for you in the audience, uh, which will in fact be uh, a contribution to the conclusions of today. Uh, the poll is, yeah, it's showing up and uh, we will create a word cloud. And the question is, which type of European cooperation for closing infrastructure material loops do you prefer? Where do you think as audience, what would help um, in the cooperation to close the material loops? Just enter your response, we'll wait a couple of seconds. Okay, hey, don't be shy. No other people who make a conclusion. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's coming up, it's coming up. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we should close it now. Responses are still coming in. Yeah. Be quick if you want to do it. And otherwise we'll close it. And I hope it's shown now. I hope we can see it. Not sure if I will see it. Ah, the poll is closed. I'm not seeing it on my screen. But the result is. Uh, Zara, maybe you can make a screenshot for Agnes and put it in the chat. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why I don't see it. Yes, no problem. That would be nice to see it uh, to come to the closing remarks uh, of today because we are all coming to an end. OK, yeah, it's a bit small, but what I can read is policies, projects. OK, can I enlarge it a bit? Yeah, Ah, CO2 pricing, yeah, uh, waste criteria and regional cooperation standards and trainings. Very nice suggestions, uh, I think, which are in line with uh, what our presenters uh, recommended uh, today. 
So definitely, uh, I think European projects and regional cooperation, um, maybe uh, via the Big Buyers Initiative also, uh, would be a nice vehicle uh, for our European cooperation and in such projects. We can deal both with technical issues, demonstration issues, and also the soft side and the uh, willingness, um, the TCL, uh, as we just learned uh, from Mr. Huerman. Uh, to make further steps and uh, it's not only industry and research partners who should cooperate we I think we definitely need we see municipalities clients uh, public procurement so it's definitely also the infra authorities uh, who should be included in uh, in such uh, projects I think to exchange knowledge experience um, and test things um, we were also very happy to have the European Commission here because European policies and standards uh, are very, very welcome on various issues uh, dealing with the whole life. Uh, we're dealing with the whole life cycle of construction works, and we see this life cycle thinking coming up more and more. And uh, pricing in this life cycle would definitely also be uh, very helpful. Um, so we should start with uh, proper design, ready for a long life, future deconstruction and reuse to the end of waste criteria and standards to allow high quality reuse of materials in the infrastructure. And then we can tap this huge potential, which is there. There's a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt uh, applied in the sector, and there's really something to gain when we close uh, this loop. So when you wake up tomorrow, be aware how important Important it is that you all share knowledge, that you cooperate uh, in the value chain and to make it happen and unlock this uh, potential. Okay, I think uh, that's it for today. Uh, we are coming to the end of, uh, of this webinar. Uh, don't forget that at four o'clock,